Hey guys, Jim here from the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum, coming at you live with another Virtual Adventures program. Once again, from the heart of Manhattan and Hell's Kitchen in New York City. Um, again, this is a free uh, and live program. If you would like this free program to keep flowing, please consider supporting us. This this uh, doesn't um, this does come at some cost. But anyway, folks. Um, Today's a very special program. Yesterday, Intrepid celebrated its 78th birthday, 78 years, right? The Intrepid was commissioned on August 16th, 1943, 78 years ago yesterday. But since we didn't have a program yesterday, we're gonna celebrate all that today. Um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the Intrepid that we know and love, but we're also gonna take a deep dive into the history of the name Intrepid, okay? Um, so we have all that coming up to look forward to, but please guys, feel free to say hi on the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum. Um, we, we love to hear all kinds of uh, stories from people who've been to the museum. Let us know what your experience was like in the chat and uh, we can do all of that. Again, our program is called What's in a Name? Six ships named Intrepid. Hey, Frankly L, how are you doing? Nice to see you here as always. Guys, this is the Intrepid as we know it uh, here today. More to the pier, Pier 86 on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River, a floating museum, right? That's part of its, part of its allure. Um, it opened up as a museum in 1982. Uh, it's a pretty special and pretty big place. Uh, for example, it's 913 feet long as it sits there in the picture. It's uh, about eight stories tall. The Intrepid served in three wars, World War II, the Cold War and Vietnam War. Um, as you see it here in the picture is as it looked in World War II. Now it didn't exactly have all those planes on it at one time. The Intrepid here is being used as a transport uh, to transport planes probably to Pearl Harbor is what you see going on here in this picture. Um, so the Intrepid did uh, or did enter service on uh, August 16th, 1943, which we consider the ship's birthday as we've been talking about. Now on that day, in tra uh, traditions abounded. As you can see here, this is a the masthead from the Intrepid uh, newsletter, which was called The Catcher. And you can see it's called Intrepid, then, now, and forever. And you can see a little in the corner, uh, in the lower, left-hand corner there of that masthead, it says volume one, okay? And is, it is dated uh, August 16th, 1943, and it was a Monday back then. Traditions abounded. There was music, speeches. Uh, the first ever crew stood at attention, like you could see here, before boarding the ship and leaving port into combat. Now, the uh, first crew, the members of first crews on warships, are called plank owners. Now this harkens back to the days of the medieval ships where they were made of wood, right? The big sailing ships. Um, and often they would give the very first crew a little piece of the wood, a little extra piece of the wood, um, wooden planks. So plank owners, and they would do the same uh, given pieces of the uh, uh, extra pieces from the flight deck of the Intrepid, for example, and for that, that specific example. So these were called plank owners, okay? The, uh, the catcher included this address by the captain, the first captain in the Intrepid, Captain Thomas Sprague. And once again, or, dated that August 16th date. No ship that ever put to sea in a time of war has had a better name than ours. Intrepid, fearless, bold, brave, undaunted, courageous, resolute, valiant, and heroic. These are the words that define our name. Let us live and fight our ship by that name. Again, Captain Thomas Sprague, first ever address before the Intrepid was launched. 
But let's take a look into the history of the name Intrepid, guys. The first appearance of the name Intrepid uh, during the, during, appeared during the 1700s, the late 1700s. Now, those of you who are history buffs might know that era as the era of the Barbary Wars. Okay, And you can see in this map here of the Mediterranean and Northern African region, the Barbary pirates and corsairs from Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli continually raided and captured merchant ships that were sailing through the Mediterranean. And often they even enslaved their crews. Um, now that was a pretty uh, important area for business. So you can see how this could be quite a blow to country's uh, economy, uh, including the brand new United States of America. Now, um, uh, brand new merchant ships were uh, protected by the, um, the Royal Navy before the American Revolution, but after the American Revolution, uh, the US was on their own, okay? And as a fledgling country, uh, they didn't really have a great Navy and good resources to take on the Barbary pirates, okay? In 1780, uh, 1785, envoys from the United States, including this guy, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, tried to negotiate a treaty with the Barbary pirates so that they could freely go in and out of the Mediterranean without being harassed. They had with them a budget of $40,000, which they were willing to pay as a tribute. Uh, you can call it kind of protection money, right? Um, to the Barbary pirates to leave their ships alone. However, this was not nearly enough for, um, for the pirates. They demanded $660,000. Dollars, right? That was a lot of money back then. Now, in 1795, the U.S. government actually paid one million dollars to Algeria to get back 150 American merchant sailors, which had been captured, uh, like I've been uh, talking about. Now, one million dollars back in 1795 was 20.4 million dollars today. Uh, not a whole heck of a lot of money compared to the U.S. budget of about $6 trillion today. But back then, guys, in 1795, this was one-sixth of the country's budget, okay, $1 million. So those $1 million payments uh, kept flowing until around 1800 when Thomas Jefferson had had enough. In May of 1801, Thomas Jefferson dispatched the first six frigates of the U.S. Navy, uh, to the Mediterranean, uh, none of them named Intrepid yet, by the way, and their job was to protect American shipping going in and out of the region. Uh, Jefferson uh, 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 later secured congressional approval to allow this uh, first U.S. expeditionary fleet, like they were called, to be able to attack pirate ships in the region and to attack on site. The French uh, built catch as you can see in this picture right here, now it catches a small two sailing, a two mast sailing ship, like you can see in the little drawing there. Um, one of the French built catches was named the Mastico, and it was built in 1798. This was built for Napoleon's fleet. Um, was sold to Tripoli, so it was being used by the pirates, and it was one of the ships that was preying on American shipping. Uh, on December 23rd in 1803. Uh, the Mastico was captured by a U.S. Navy schooner named the Enterprise, by the way. It was under the command of this guy, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur. He captured the ship. It was renamed. Uh, he renamed the Mastico the Intrepid. Okay, fearless, bold, fortitude, all those synonyms, right? And raised the American flag. And thus, we had the first use of the name Intrepid in history. It was that little catch. Now, it was only a matter of time before Intrepid got its first mission. And its first mission was to rescue the captured pirate frigate, the Philadelphia. Now, the Philadelphia um, uh, had been, uh, was, was a U.S. naval ship, which had been captured by the pirates as well. So the job of the Intrepid and Stephen Decatur was to sneak into Tripoli Harbor, where the Philadelphia had actually run aground a few months earlier. Uh, which was uh, the, the whole reason why she was captured, where she was able to be captured. Now, the ship was powerful, and if it could be uh, um, taken off the sandbar by the pirates, it could potentially be used by those pirates as a weapon against U.S. shipping. So Stephen Decatur was ordered to destroy the Philadelphia. Intrepid snuck into the harbor under the cover of darkness, pretending to be a pirate ship who had lost her anchor in a storm. 
However, the cover was quickly blown when guards uh, on the Philadelphia noticed that the intrepid, there was the anchor right there on deck. So something was up, the jig was up right then, you could say. Um, so they sounded the alarm. Stephen Decatur boarded the ship Philadelphia with 60 men and set fire to the ship. Now among those 60 men was some of the very first US Marines, adding to what would later become the Marine Corps hymn from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, okay? So this is where they were in Tripoli right there. Uh, Stephen Decatur was the absolute last man off the Philadelphia, waiting until the masts of the ship were fully engulfed in the fire before returning to the Intrepid. Famous um, British naval hero, Horatio Nelson, called it uh, called the, the, the event the most bold and daring act of our age. High praise indeed coming from Horatio Nelson there. Um, now the second and what would turn out to be the last mission of the Intrepid would come uh, in September, 1804. It was under the command of Commandant, Master Commandant, excuse me, R. Summers. And he was given the command, he was given command of the Intrepid and was um, the, the Intrepid was to be used as what they called a fire ship. You see the Intrepid was loaded with barrels of gunpowder and explosives. It was his job uh, to sail into Trip Tripoli Harbor under the cover of darkness once again with 12 volunteers. And he was to anchor himself and the Intrepid um, under the walls of the city of Tripoli, as you can see on the map right here. Uh, and amongst as many pi ships of the pirate fleet as, pos as possible, the plan was to light a 15 minute fuse to all of that gunpowder and all those explosives, and then quickly board a, a, a smaller ship and row away to the safety of nearby American ships. However, yeah, the Intrepid was discovered and attacked by pirates before reaching the city walls. And so Summers just ignited the fuse right then and there, sacrificing his and his crew's lives to take a few pirate ships down with them. Now, after washing ashore, uh, several of the crew uh, were recovered and were buried in an unmarked grave. And later, actually, in 1949, the Libyan gov government discovered that grave and uh, uh, created, along with the assistance of the United States government, created a small military uh, cemetery in Tripoli, which you could go see today as well. All right, it is time for the second Intrepid. Okay, guys, the second Intrepid looked like this. Okay, I think I like the first one better, it is an experimental steam-powered torpedo ram built in 1874. Now, navies around the world were experimenting with self-propelled torpedoes in the 1870s, as far back as the 1870s. Um, however, someone decided for a torpedo ram, it would be a good idea to stick a high explosive torpedo on the end of a big long wooden post and ram it into an enemy ship. Now, the Intre Intrepid conducted a number of such tests in 1874 and 1875, proving it, after all, wasn't such a great idea that the ship intended to explode and go down along with the torpedo ram. Uh, there were plans to, to convert Intrepid uh, into uh, a gunboat, but Intrepid was instead sold for scrap in 1892, ending our second Intrepid. Guys, Intrepid number three was a steel-hulled bark. And a bark is uh, a special kind of ship. It's, it's two center masts were squared with the deck while the fore and the, and the aft masts were kind of stuck at that angle like you see right there, okay? Um, now, this was to be used as a floating barracks where new sailors, before they would officially be assigned to the crew of a warship, would go and they would be able to uh, practice basic skills that they had just come that they had just learned um, and uh, be, be you know have a bunk and be able to eat on this bark before being assigned uh, this third intrepid served until 1920 before being re uh, decommissioned excuse me in 1921 then it would be repurposed as a dredging barge before being decommissioned completely. Now, um, in the 1920s and 30s, the barge was reactivated by the Navy 
Um, and in the Second World War, when it started, it actually served under the name Sludge Removal Barge. Okay, not as impressive as Intrepid. I know not as, not as glorious, but I guess all names can't be glorious. I don't know. But the uh, sludge removal barge was actually present at Pearl Harbor when the Empire of Japan attacked. Um, and it actually aided in the uh, recovery of the Oklahoma, the battleship Oklahoma that was sunk uh, during the Pearl Harbor's attacks. Um, it served again as a commercial dredging barge after the war, um, uh, running until around 1954 when it finally did run aground on the banks of the Columbia River, about 50 miles northwest of, of Portland, thus being the end to Intrepid number three. Guys, that does bring us to Intrepid number four, and that's the one we're familiar with. Okay, that's, all, that's the one we all know and love. It's the one I am currently broadcasting from now. Construction began on the Intrepid just six days after the attack on Pearl Harbor, and it was originally take, uh, scheduled to take uh, three to sometimes as many, uh, some say as many as five years to complete. But uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, we no longer had that kind of time. So the Intrepid was worked on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 10,000 workers alone were hired to work on ships of its type, and it was finished in just 17 months. And again, entered service when it was uh, upon commissioning on August 16, 1943. Now, the Intrepid served uh, in the Pacific beginning on January 5, 1945, 1944, when it did uh, 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 arrive at Pearl Harbor. And throughout the remainder of the war, the Intrepid was damaged and knocked out of commission uh, numerous, on numerous occasions, once by a torpedo and four times by Japanese kamikaze attacks only to stream back into action just uh, uh, months after being repaired. In fact, the Japanese reported the Intrepid as being sunk so many uh, times, only to see it sail back into the action, the Japanese began calling the Intrepid the ghost ship. Now, after World War II, the Intrepid was modernized and served with distinction throughout the Cold War. The Intrepid served as a recovery ship in the 1960s for the Mercury 7 and Gemini 3 space missions and served three tours of duty in the Vietnam War from 1966 to 1969. The Intrepid would be decommissioned on March 15, 1974 and brought here to the west side of Manhattan um, in New York City in, early, uh, in the early 1980s, 1982 to be exact, and officially opened up uh, on that date. So guys, those are all the um, intrep those are all the USS intrepids, okay? If you guys, by the way, if you know what USS stands for, put it down there in the chat for me. Let's see, it is an acronym. And most naval ships, but not all, are actually uh, uh, upon commissioning, gain the right to to have the USS in their title. So if you guys know what USS means, so Michael, I see you worked as a, as a tour guide uh, on the Intrepid. Was that true? Oh, when the Jerry Roberts was was here as well. Okay, so you know exactly what the USS is all about. Put that in the chat. If you were thinking it means United States ship, that's exactly what it means. Okay, USS. So most warships in the U.S. Navy uh, still carry that USS, and you gain the right to have that USS title when you are commissioned. You lose that title, by the way, when you are decommissioned. So the Intrepid is, as it sits now as a museum, is no longer the USS Intrepid. It is just the Intrepid. Okay, and if you come to see our Growler submarine as well, uh, it's just the Growler, not the uh, USS Growler anymore. Okay, so that being said, that is all the USS Growl, uh, USS Intrepids. But there's a couple more ships that I want to talk to you about. Okay, the first one is actually the second in, in, in Intrepid, if you go by uh, time and not the title USS, gets a little confusing. Hope I'm not confusing you. Um, it's not a Navy ship of all at all, but it was an airship of sorts. It was a hydrogen filled observation balloon for the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, it was um, created by this guy. This is Professor Thaddeus Lowe. He produced about six of those things for the Union Army. The largest one was named Intrepid. Of course, the largest and best one was named Intrepid. 
Uh, it was capable of carrying an operator and a telegraph machine. Now, by using these things, the Union Army was uh, able to observe battlefield, uh, the battlefield as a whole from the air and get some critical intel of uh, Confederate troop movements, such as this, uh, this depiction here of the Battle of Fair Oaks. And if you look carefully in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that observation balloon, okay? Um, thought to be the intrepid as well. Um, that brings us guys to the final intrepid and uh, not my favorite, but uh, uh, I hesitate to say it's my favorite. I don't know, so people might get mad at me around here if I don't say that this intrepid is the favorite one, but I do wanna talk to you about uh, this intrepid, okay? Now we all know that the first moon landing uh, happened during the Apollo 11 mission. It was accomplished by the lunar module, which was named what, by the way? If you guys remember what that lunar module, that was the first one to land on the moon, put it down there in the chat. Uh, it might bring back memories of a bird. If you are thinking, nope, it wasn't a sparrow. It wasn't a seagull. It might be the, the, the bird of the United States, the symbol of the United States. Yes, the eagle. There you go, Doug, very good. And the eagle had indeed landed, okay? But the, um, the lunar module of the next mission, Apollo 12, okay, would be named the Intrepid. You got it. Now, all three members, uh, all three crew members of Apollo 12, uh, you can see them right here. That's Commander Pete Comrade, Command Module Pilot Richard Gordon, and Lunar Module Pilot uh, Alan Bean. They were all naval aviators, okay? Now, the liftoff of Apollo 12 happened on uh, November 14th, 1969, and went smoothly. Commander Conrad said, quote, that's a lovely liftoff, and that's not bad at all. But it didn't last long, okay, guys, because 36.5 seconds after that, the Saturn V rocket was struck by lightning. Now, this caused circuits in the service module to incorrectly uh, detect overloads. And so it took all three fuel cells that the rocket had offline, along with most of the command module's instru instruments. Uh, if that sounds bad, it was. Now, guys, they, what do they say about lightning? They say lightning never strikes in the same place twice, except it does, and it did. 52 seconds after launch, the rocket was struck by lightning again, which took out this time the altitude indicator. Now, data going back to mission control came back all garbled, but the vehicle continued to fly on course. All three astronauts frantically tried to figure out what was going on and what was happening in the command module. But back in mission control, NASA engineer John Aaron recognized the garbled data uh, that was being transmitted and that it was similar to a training simulation from uh, uh, a year earlier. Now, Aaron recommended to the crew to, quote, try SCE to aux, and I wrote down there in the bottom right hand, uh, bottom left hand corner, SCE to aux, which neither the flight engineer nor the astronauts, Pink Conrad or Dick Gordon recognized. Conrad's exact words were, quote, SCE to aux, what the hell's that? Okay, now let me show you a, uh, a schematic of the uh, Apollo 12's command module uh, control panel. Look at that. Now, take a look at this thing. Can you find SCE uh, and can you turn it to aux? Take a good look at that and, and, and let me know if you, if you can make heads or tails of this. And maybe we have a future uh, engineer, if not astronaut or pilot uh, in the group listening uh, or watching. I don't know about you, but I can't find where the SCE to aux is. But, you know, Alan Bean, now, Alan Bean, the third member of the crew, he was the rookie astronaut. This was his first trip into space. He was the only one that remembered this from a training exercise. In fact, it was a simulated power failure exercise that he had gone through, and he remembered exactly where SCE to AUX was. And so he took that SCE switch, and he simply flipped it over to AUX, and that completely uh, uh, restored power to the failed system. 
right? Apollo 12 went on to make a successful pinpoint landing on the moon. I, I mean pinpoint exactly where they were supposed to land. And this was the first ever to make such a close pinpoint landing. If you remember the Apollo 11 um, Eagle landing was, was uh, turned out to be several miles off course. Uh, and Conrad was the first to exit the lunar module becoming the third human to walk on the moon, exclaiming, quote, whoopee, man, that may have been a small one for Neil, meaning Neil Armstrong, but it was a long one for me. Of course, uh, uh, referencing Neil Armstrong's one small step for, for man, one large, um, one large leap, one giant leap is what I was trying to say, one giant leap for mankind, okay? Guys, um, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. But that is our story of six ships named Intrepid. Um, we do want to thank you guys for 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 um, tuning in for our program. And once again, if you would like this pre this free uh, programming to keep flowing, consider supporting us. And by the way, I'm going to ask. Uh, um, Elysia to put in in the in the in the chat there a link that you can chat to let us know what you thought of this short and sweet program here, right? And do, don't forget to tag us in all of your uh, all your postings, and do come visit us from time to time. Again, we're open seven days a week, um, but don't forget to wear your mask when you come, all right? So, guys, thank you once again for uh, tuning in. And we'll see you on Thursday again at six o'clock when Alicia will be back on, on the screen. It's kind of a very special program for you again. Uh, and make sure you're hungry when you watch it. Make sure you eat it before you, you watch it before because she's gonna talk a little bit about snacking in space. And we'll see you then guys. Bye-bye.